Hey everyone, this is all about the 2022 AP World History exam, joined by Emily Glankler, she of Antisocial Studies. How are you doing? Hey, good, how's it going? I'm John from Marker Learning. Um, the AP World History exam happened to, it happened on, happened at hundreds of thousands of young people and yes. teachers. Emily, we're gonna be going through, I'm gonna share my screen for just a second. I wanna walk you through this, just a couple permissions and reminders. The College Board always releases at least one set of free response questions for us. There were other versions. You're actually not allowed to talk about those versions and there's multiple choice questions and there's really nothing like we can say about them. We're not gonna get a copy of them released widely. So this document I've linked to at the top of the chat this is where Emily's going to be drawing all this information from tonight. At a high level, Emily, here's my question. Was this exam earth shatteringly different from what we expected? Was it impossible to anticipate or was it like a kind of normal exam? It was kind of a normal and I would say a sort of generous exam. And I just feel like we have to acknowledge up front that I 100% called this DBQ. You did. Like, word for word like called this dbq and side note that you and me the dbq that marco made as a practice for last year that you made me write was like not it wasn't the same specific topic but it was very similar to this dbq so i just feel very vindicated and i yeah i'm gonna shamelessly relentlessly plug what we did <laughs> this video right here it's on our playlist for ap world history everyone's called emily writes a dbq parentheses because john from marco learning i.e me made her do it dot 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 and parentheses <laughs> Then I graded it, talked about your writing being bad, roasted you a little bit, gave you a very high score, but this prompt is this topic generally and this period. So we are prophets of- yeah. I feel like I'm on a list. I feel like the college board is like, is now spying on me and they think that I have smuggled out some information, but- um, Are but you that, spying on the college board? I mean, it's just, just- I mean, I wouldn't say it here, that's for okay. sure. We'll but edit that out of the recorded version, okay. I will say two, so two things about this. One, I thought this, I, I was really happy when I saw these prompts because I, I thought for the most part they were fair. I thought there were enough, there were one or two that were weird enough that I was like, that'll help differentiate kids. But I didn't think there was any 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 set or any question that was just wildly unfair. Honestly, last year I was I felt a little bit that way about the Mexican Revolution one because I was like, yes. ugh, so hard to bring in additional evidence. The other thing I guess I just want to say for everyone that's in the chat is like you might be, you know, I feel like some people are like, why are we going through this when the test is over? One, I think it's just nice to get some closure. Like I just think it's nice you've you've built up for this test. It's nice to be validated that like, oh, some of the stuff I write I wrote was probably good because you won't know your scores till July. So yeah, and I think for those of you who are teachers, special shout out to America's teachers who made it through another horrible year of all of this. Um, but I think it also gives us a sense of how to use this in the future. You referenced last year's prompt, which was the 2021 AP World History Exam, DBQ, was a very narrow feeling one about yeah. the Mexican, Ameri Mexican Revolution that was like, a lot of students immediately were like, well, my teacher didn't teach this to me. Like, I didn't. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. I don't. I was like, ooh. I was like looking at the documents, trying to know more about that. It's not a subject I, I particularly know about. World history is hard because it's 800 years and it's the whole planet. And none of us can be experts in all those things. So, Emily, I'm going to turn it over to you for your analysis. I'm going to be in the chat. I'll pop in and out. Um, but thank you for, for doing this. I can't wait to hear what you're going to share about the exam. Of course. Yeah. So I made a little PowerPoint because, of course, I did. I like live my life according to a Google slide. So um, I, all I did was, so John in the chat has linked the prompts. These are like free and release now. That's why we're talking about them. Um, and so I'm not gonna go through and literally like tell you every potential answer for every prompt. What I'm gonna do is just kind of talk through like this seems like what the question was kind of getting at or the type of answer they were looking for. Keep in mind, students, there are many, many, many right answers. So um, there are some wrong answers. You know, you could have just misread a document or something, but there are also a lot of right answers. So if anything, I just want you to kind of feel like, okay, cool, I sort of interpreted that question right and was sort of on topic. And if so, then you're probably gonna do okay, right? It just, cause if I don't mention the exact answer you gave, don't panic, right? So. We'll go through the SAQs fairly quickly. They, giving an SAQ on the Mongols is very kind. I think that was really nice because everyone, it sticks in their brains. Everyone loves the Mongols or loves to hate the Mongols or whatever. And this is a pretty typical, I think, AP history question. And I'll be honest, if you're a teacher watching, this seems to be definitely where the College Board is moving. They're moving to more and more and more of these questions. Like five years ago, they barely asked questions like this, where they're like, 
challenge this historian's argument, give evidence for this historian's argument. There's more and more of those questions and also an A push too. So this is basically a historian saying that, hey, like the Mongols were the beginning of this kind of modern world, right? I mean, that's a really common thesis. I have my students every year read the introduction to uh, Jack Weatherford's book called Genghis Khan and the Making of the Modern World. It's basically saying like, um, they can be regarded as the first chapter of a new era, that they begin the early modern era. And so then it's just asking for like, what's one economic development that supports his argument about Mongols integrating the old, old world? I mean, reunification of Silk Road trade, all that good stuff, right? I think the one that probably freaked students out the most is B. So like, tell me a piece of evidence that could challenge this, that the Mongols are the first chapter of a new era. And so you have to basically, because probably your teachers, if they talked about the Mongols, might have talked about how new and innovative they were. And this basically asking, we'll argue against that. Say like, what's a reason why the Mongols actually weren't the beginning of a new era? I hilariously think, I don't know. And John, actually, I'm curious your thoughts on this. I feel like you could cite the College Board as a source. If I wanted to be super petty, I could say, well, one piece of evidence is that the College Board classifies the early modern era as beginning at 1450, which is a full hundred years after the Mongol century. And I don't know. What do you think? No. No? No, I don't. I, that would be, I I don't, I'm going to have to, that, that's but such. You could, you could say like a piece of evidence is that like, why would the College Board extend the post-classical era to 150 years after Genghis Khan if he starts a new era? I'm just okay. saying. Okay, you're an AP reader. You've done this before. Would you accept that? Would you would you accept the sass that came with that? I would applaud. That? I would applaud. Yeah, because I'm like, there. okay, again, I don't think that's what I would have actually written, but I do think that's hilarious because they're basically <laughs> asking you to argue against their own classification that like, by their own definition, the Mongols don't start a new era because then they would have started a new era in the course. Anyway, okay. Okay. We will cut that. We strike that from the record. That is not the marker learning position. On I'm definitely on a list somewhere. Cite so the CED. I think what they were getting at is like that all they did was they reunited Silk Road trade. They reunited China and and um, Western Europe. That um, you know they're actually assimilating to local cultures, so they're not like expanding Mongol culture anywhere. You could make the argument that it's really like out of the ashes of the Mongol Empire, that new gunpowder empires rise. You could argue the Mongols didn't make it to Western Europe. So it's like there's long term transformations that happen, but they're they're not like I, I feel like for B, you also could discuss other events around this time period that do start a new era. So I might have most simplistically just said, no, it's 1492. Just been like the real beginning of the early modern era is clearly 1492 when we discover, discover, right? I don't know. Um, and then C, I think we're all fine. So B, I think is the funkiest one. And if you're a teacher watching this, I would start, I'm gonna probably start doing more to get my kids to practice. Like here's a very common historical argument. Now let's argue against it, right? Okay. This one I think freaked kids out. This seems like the weird one that they threw in there. So if you also felt a little weird about this one, you're correct. So this is basically getting at like spheres of influence in the Canton system in China, right? This is showing like a survey of Canton, this trading city, all these different factories and gardens and whatever. And so basically the development that leads to this situation, the economic development could be the rise of economic imperialism. Um, it could be the opium trade leading to the opium wars. It could be industrialization. Um, a political development, again, opium wars, the kind of unequal treaties by the British, um, the declining power of the Qing dynasty, they're unable to like give up control or retain control. And then really see like, why is this survey being carried about, out by the British Royal Navy? It just shows us that the British are really in control of these major trading ports, right? So again, if you, but this is, I say this is the weird one because one, it's a weird document, kind of freaks kids out because they're like a boathouse. What do I need to know about the boathouse? Nothing. You don't need to know anything about the boathouse. Honestly, you could get all the information you need from the source information. Um, and the, but this is a pretty specific document because you really have to understand the context of like, this is China in maybe after the first or second opium war um, as as their port cities are getting carved up. But again, so I think this one was the weirdest one. If you felt not super confident in this one, I think they'll probably be fairly kind in what they ask 
what they accept as like economic and political developments. And I think probably they'll also be a little bit kind on if it's an economic development that kind of veers into political or back and forth, as long as you don't probably write the same thing for both. So as long as you didn't write the identical answer for A and B, if, it, if you're like, oh shoot, was my answer economic or social or political? I feel like they will probably end up being a little bit nice on that, as long as you don't just write like copy and paste the same answer. All right. Um, I like we're asking in the chat, were you freaked out by SAQ too? I would have been when I first looked at it. I was like, huh? These are so nice. These were so nice. I hope y'all felt that way. These two sets that don't have stimuli. I mean, I would have, I would have picked three in a heartbeat, right? Um, partly because this was a whole LEQ a few years ago. And if you actually use my resources, my anti-socialist resources, I do a whole LEQ workshop on the impacts of the Colombian exchange. So again, me and Marco, we know what we're doing. Um, so again, I think three is very straightforward as long as you paid attention to like C, for example, says how it affected the environment. So make sure you make sure you like talked about, but environment could be disease. It could be new crops. It could be new animals, migrations of people, anything. Four is also fairly straightforward. I mentioned actually in my Heimler, the big review of unit nine, I literally said like the one event they always ask about is the green revolution. So that's you know, basically improving, agri like using new technology and science to improve agriculture. So if you talked about GMOs, factory farming, pesticides, um, whatever, that was good. But again, I think I would imagine way more students probably chose three than four. Um, unless, I mean, you would have picked four if you were like, oh yeah, I know exactly what the green revolution is, but otherwise these seem pretty straightforward, which I was happy about. Um, okay, cool. So the DBQ, I have all the documents, but I just went through and kind of summed them up because I don't, you know, this is a short recap. We don't need to go through and relive the whole DBQ. I will just say, I think this is a very nice DBQ. And honestly, this is a DBQ I will probably use in future years of my class a lot because it's really effective. It covers like a big topic. Um, that's really important to the course. Again, I called it, I said unit six, they haven't asked about imperialism in years. And so I think that the, um, I also think that this is a DBQ that, that you could have a simple or a complex answer, which is another reason why I really like this one. Because on the surface, you can just say it was bad. You can, I mean, you could just say like, European imperialism was bad for like the people of Africa and Asia, but it maybe overall grew the economies. And that is, is a pretty straightforward answer and would be a good answer, right? Um, I also think there was a lot of opportunity to hip documents if you wanted to try that, because if you noticed a lot of these later documents that were about how brutal the, the um, colonial powers were, like the Congolese refugee, the um, activist from Zimbabwe, those weren't published till the like 1940s, 50s, 60s, which is like decolonization. So that could have been a cool hip. But yeah, in general, right, this question is evaluate the extent to which European, the Zoom thing's right in my way. I don't know why I can't move it. Ah, okay, European something. Um, imperialism affected the economies in Africa and or Asia in the 19th and early 20th centuries. So again, what you kind of get from this is you ah, you get um, a set of a few documents at first that are from the Brit uh, the European perspective that are saying, hey, look how good it's been, right? I mean, so that's sort of to be expected, especially document one and two is like, hey, we're trying to like pay them. We're trying to like get these sugar, um, factory workers, really good jobs, and we're going to pay them really well, but they're all too caught up doing forced labor for the government or local elites. That would be a hilarious one to hit because you're like, really? Really? Because you're, you're like a representative of the Dutch government factory, and you're telling me that you want to pay these workers super well, but you can't because they're doing coerced labor for, who's that again? The Dutch government? Isn't that you? Right? So I think this would be a good, you could analyze this one, right? We also see a chart, um, Let's just kind of go through these. We see like, so this one again, I think is a pretty hilarious document, right? It's a manager of a government run factory being like, man, we just want to give these Javanese workers incredible jobs in a factory that are very well paid, but they're too busy being forced to work on sugar fields by the Dutch government or local elites, right? 
Um, so it's like, hey, we're trying to improve their lives. We're trying to give them steady jobs, but the like old traditional structures are holding us back. Uh, document two um, is an interesting one that's on the surface pretty simple, right? It's like we're exporting raw textiles from India to Great Britain, and then we're importing back um, cloth. And I think, again, this could be another hippable thing. You could be like, hey, look, the export of raw materials in 1810, then a few, a few decades later, we're importing back cloth. And so this is showing us like the rise of industrialization in Britain and their factories are getting more efficient. And so they're able to now like produce more and more um, but yeah, so this could be used in an argument of overall growth that like overall um, the, you know, Indian raw textiles are getting exported a lot and then they're getting back manufactured goods, which you could argue would be good for like standard of living. But then of course we see this document right next to it, which is great. So again, if you were wanting to kind of go for some complexity, you could put these two documents next to each other. And you could see that like, okay, this is a really complex document that you could analyze in a lot of different ways. Teachers, if you're watching, this would be a great document to explain to students complexity because this is a document that you could use as evidence for the both arguments. The argument that it was good for the people of Asia and that it was bad for the people of Asia. And then you could connect it to other documents. So this I think is a document I will like use as a case study in complexity this is an Indian journalist, so you might anticipate that he's going to be like, India should be free, it's Britain's bad. But he's saying, no, no, it's actually good. British rule has increased the trade of India. It's expanded our agriculture because now we have a steady market that will buy all of our stuff. But then he's saying, sure, 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 the entire cotton weaving trade may have collapsed. But like, just move on, y'all, get over it. Sure, maybe like generations and generations of your ancestors have been cotton weavers, but like, quit your crying and just go start up a farm. That's basically what he's saying. Notice he's an intellectual. You might analyze his point of view and be like, that's real cute. This journalist thinks it's so easy for maybe a rural family that's stuck in a lower caste to just like switch their entire family occupation. But he's basically saying like, look, if you just get on board if you switch over to agriculture, which is what the British want, it's going to be great for all of us, right? Um, he's saying people in our country, right, are reluctant to give up their hereditary trades. This is where you could do some analysis of the historical situation. Talk about the caste system. Well, maybe it's not that they're reluctant to give up their hereditary trades. Maybe they just, like, can't. They actually literally can't, right? So, again, this is such a rich, I, I hate saying rich text, but I think I'm going to say it. This is such a rich text because there's just, you could, you could pull in document three for an argument for good and bad. You could hip it. You could tie it to other documents. I love this one. Okay. Um, okay, document four. I, want, I hope some of us noticed, check this out, that we have the Indabeli, I'm so sorry if I'm saying that wrong, tribe here. And then we also have it two documents later. I'm gonna come back to this in a second, but look, we have another representative here. So again, this is why I say that I love this DBQ and I'm gonna use it in future years to teach the DBQ because they gave you some documents that very easily pair together that you could like use to modify and corroborate. So, um, so yeah, this is the ruler of this tribe and a contract with Cecil Rhodes' company basically saying you have, um, basically infinite mining rights in my kingdom. It's still my kingdom though, so that's important, right? And you're gonna pay me a monthly, basically, amount and you're gonna give me rifles and steamboats. So you could use this to argue that like, it empowered certain local rulers. But again, that's why I would skip ahead to document six and say, but did it? Because this is talking about a huge like rebellion by this is one of the members of this guy's tribes this guy's tribe and he's saying like hey well here's my memoir about rebelling and then being forced into essentially like debt slavery right so again this is what i mean by like complexity and corroborating is you can say well sure point of view from the top down this ruler is probably doing just fine he's able to like you know get a lot of money he's able to kind of like do this deal with the english but it, that doesn't mean his whole tribe wants this to happen, wants their ancestral land gone. And in fact, we now know that just a few years after this contract was signed, there was a rebellion. And now they're like stuck in this sort of sharecropping slash debt slavery situation. Um, 
Document five, I think, is pretty straightforward. It's just the brutal working conditions of the rubber workers, and then that you could pair with this, the brutal working conditions of Africans on cotton plantations, right? Um, and again, just one last um, note about HIP, right? I mean, one of the reasons why I think some of these are nice for hipping is that they're published at such a radically different time than like they occurred. So this is a memoir based on this uprising, but it's not published till the 1960s. Same here, like this is not published till 1936, like 46 years later. Um, and so again, that could be analysis because you, you don't have to, for analysis and for context, you can talk about other time periods. So you could say, hey, why are some of these memoirs from the perspective of these brutalized workers, why are they not being published till till so much later? And you might argue, well, I'm sure while they're under colonial rule, they're not allowed. Like they're not gonna have any way to publish that. It's not till they get independence that they're able to like tell their story. So yeah, I think this is a really, Again, I don't say nice DBQ like an easy DBQ. You have to do a lot of work to put all this together. But I just mean, I, I think there's a lot of opportunities for additional evidence, right? Because we've talked a lot. I mean, there's nothing in here. Let me, let's go back to this main prompt, right? I mean, you just need to talk about something that's not in the documents. And because they said 19th and early 20th centuries, that opens it up a little bit too. But let me think about some other things you could talk about. I mean... You could talk about uh, Egypt, right? So you could talk about Egypt being somewhat of a colony of the British and the French. You could talk about the building of the Suez Canal. So as a positive, like helping build infrastructure. Um, you could talk about like, mm, I'm trying to think, it has to be related to the economy. You talk about Cecil Rhodes who wanted to build a trans-African railway, but it got stopped because of German, um, colonies so that could be a cool extra thing that you could put in here where they're talking about like you could pair together like Rhodes mining company with this German colony and say like hey ironically like this German colony is the thing that stood in the way of Cecil Rhodes's dream of like a trans-African railway which would have connected it all up to Egypt um, and again Asia is so massive keep in mind Asia includes Middle East China and India. So honestly, you could talk about China. You could talk about the opium wars and the spheres of influence. You could talk about how um, it devastated the Chinese economy and forced it open. You could talk about Japan. Japan's part of Asia. You could go Meiji Restoration. As long as you make it clear, oh, maybe not Meiji Restoration because that's not European empire building. But as long as you made it clear to the reader that you understand that like, for example, the Chinese spheres of influence after the opium wars it is European empire building, but it's not quite the same as like direct control of an empire. I think that'd be great. Um, yeah, tons of stuff you can talk about here. Okay, let's just look at the SAQ, uh, the LEQ options and then we'll kind of wrap up and I'll see what John thinks. Um, Real quick, actually, yeah. Emily, I just wanted to shout out to everyone who's being really amazing in the chat here. We've done a few polls and a few things and was we pull up questions two, three, and four, I run a poll here on which long essay question people did. And by far, you know, about half of the groom did here question number three um, yeah. on military religion stuff. We did the, the second most popular was Q2, uh, which is that first one on the pre-Columbian Americas. And then the final one on free market ideas was the least popular. Which is also surprising. Want to report on another important poll. I think you were like deep in a DBQ land while I ran this. Uh -oh. I asked, why is Emily so good at predicting everything on the exam? <laughs> and the number one answer was the option I may or may not have scripted, which is she's a magician, parentheses, which 49%, which yeah. is a reference, of course, to Monty Python, which we did a podcast on. But anyway, um, you have just been declared a witch by the chat. Yay! The second most common answer was that she's very smart, 43%. So 43%. Well, so, but John, you know, a very smart woman is also a witch, right? That's if this was 1610, that's how we'd solve this problem of how to explain how smart you are at yeah. prophesying this exam. The 6% um, did say you're actually not that good at predictions. So just pointing that out, a um, little roast before I hide in the chat again. Yeah, I would say to that 6% that you're not very good at answering surveys. So. Um, I'm just kidding. I love y'all equally. So yeah. Okay. I say this is surprising because I'm with y'all. I think the, I think question four on these LAQs is the hardest one. I think the 20th century one is the hardest one, which is rare. Normally the 20th century one is the one that the, like a lot of students choose, 
But let's walk through this because each of these has one thing that makes it tricky. I do think these LEQs, I think the DBQ was fairly straightforward. And I think these LEQs are not entirely tricky, but there's just like one little part in there that I can see some students going off on a tangent and never coming back. So for example, question two says, evaluate the extent to which just one pre-Columbian state consolidated and centralized its authority. This is something that I, I, I guess I'm gonna have to stop saying because I think it's pretty rare that they make you, it's like the Mexican Revolution DBQ, that they make you talk about just one civilization. Now they let you choose, but I generally expect more questions that are like how pre-Columbian states to where you could mix and match and talk about the Aztecs and the Inca or whatever. And let's be honest, we're all talking about the Aztec or the Inca. I don't think anyone's writing about the Mississippian civilization. And if you are, like, I'm so proud of you. I couldn't write that essay. So again, what you'd be getting here is you would be picking the Aztec or the Inca and then doing, and then it's a pretty straightforward essay if you know enough about it. So you can talk about using agriculture for the Aztecs, that's chinampas, for the Inca terrace farming. You could talk about building infrastructure, so maybe using like the tribute system with the Aztecs versus the Mita system, building roads and bridges and the Inca. You could talk for both about human sacrifice and religion as a way to rule, temple of the sun, emperors seen as gods, all that good stuff. So again, if you know some details about one or the other, then I feel like that's pretty nice. And what's cool about this is that then maybe if you brought in a comparison like if, you, if your whole essay was focusing on the Inca, but then you wanted to bring in a comparison to the Aztecs, that could start to get into like reasoning and complexity, which would be kind of cool. Um, this one is probably the one I would have chosen. But again, I just, you have to make sure you're, you're focusing on military conflict or conquest. So it's saying evaluate the extent to which military conflict or conquest was the main cause of religious change in this period, meaning, during this time period, were people essentially forced to change religions or did they choose to change religions? This is kind of what they're asking. And I mean, I think you can make a really easy argument that they were forced. I mean, I'm not laughing at that. I'm just like, you could, I mean, the conquest of the Americas, right? I mean, literally you could have focused your whole essay on the forced conversion of the indigenous people of the Americas, right? And that's why the fact that they said, or conquest is very nice because if it just said military conflict, you'd be just focusing on wars, which of course, yeah, the war with the Aztecs, but the conversion really comes later. But what this is getting at is one of the main parts of unit three. Again, I predicted, I said, there's gonna be something on unit three because they haven't asked about religion or con or like consolidating power unit three in a long time. So whoever said I was bad at predicting. Hmm. Um, because this is getting at, you know, 3.3 in the course is like essentially religion and consolidating power. And so you had the Protestant Reformation, you could talk about the Protestant Catholic Wars of Europe, but that would really be more religious change causing military conflict. Again, there's some cool complexity. You could be like in some places like Western Europe, religious change came first, and then military conflict or conquest came was the result of that, right? But I think the easiest argument is the conquest of the Americas. You could talk about the arrival of the Portuguese in the Indian Ocean and bringing Christianity. You could talk about the Sunni Shia wars in the gunpowder empires. You could talk about Japan, the Tokugawa shogunate, closing itself off to Christian missionaries and like forcefully kicking people out because they're fearful that it might come, that military conflict might come. Um, great context for this one would be the Crusades. I mean, just really like spot on context would be like, hey, in previous eras, military conflict or conquest attempted to bring religious change, but kind of failed. And then here's the, um, here's the last one. I think this one's the hardest one. And the reason why I think it's the hardest one is the word late. Late 20th century is, is kind of vague. And now it's vague in a way that's nice, but it asks, the extent to which the spread of free market ideas led to economic change in the late 20th century. So what this is getting at is the decline and end of the Cold War and like the, the fact that free market ideas won. So we're talking like 1970s, 80s, 90s, like the fall of the Soviet Union, the market reforms in China under Deng Xiaoping, we're talking about the Soviet bloc having to transition away from communism. Now, to be clear, late 20th century is broad enough that if you talked about, 
I'm just worried some kids wrote a whole Cold War essay. I'm just worried some kids were just like, just saw free market economic change 20th century and just started talking about the US trying to spread free market ideas and contain communism, which is all great. That's on topic, that's good. You got points for that. You got points for context, you got points for some evidence. But again, this, this is an example of, this is a fairly specific prompt that's talking about, okay, as we spread free market ideas, economic change. And so I think you could start, I mean, I think, I think as long as you can find most of your answer to world, post-World War II, then you're good. So you could start with Japan. You could start with like post-war Japan having this massive kind of economic miracle with the U.S. kind of like taking away its military and like them transitioning all that to, to producing manufactured stuff, cell phones, cars. Um, you could talk about Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher and NAFTA and all this stuff. You could talk about the EU um, expanding this whole like regional trade. And again, you could talk about communist countries committing market reform. So Gorbachev, Glasnost and Perestroika, Deng Xiaoping in China, Vietnam did that as well. The one, the one outlier is North Korea and potentially Cuba, although Cuba committed some market reforms as well. So again, um, this is a this is fine. I can just see some students seeing some of the buzzwords and going into a whole analysis of maybe like the causes of the Cold War and not talking about the this essay is really getting at that free market ideas kind of won the Cold War. Um, yeah. So again, I, I'm curious, John, kind of your thoughts on all this. I, I think this is a really fair test. I think the LEQ was harder. The LEQ prompts, I think, were harder than the DBQ prompt, which I think is nice because you get a choice of the LEQ. So I think that's cool. And I think there was one weird SAQ. Full on, the whole thing was weird. And then the other SAQ seemed fair enough. Yeah, you know, I think the challenge in particular with this course, because at Marco Learning, we cover a lot of, we cover AP Euro, which is one continent, 500 years. AP US history, one nation, 400-ish years. And this is all nations, 800 years. And so mm -hmm. it does feel like you're throwing darts as a teacher. I When I taught AP World a few years ago, I taught the old like 6,000 year one, which was even more preposterous, where you're just randomly grabbing things. I think the thing for teachers to and, and students to think about is, y'all did your best with what you had. But yeah. the question is, what did you have when you came in? So we've got, you know, in, in number three here, what do you actually know about religious practices around the world that is, has some specific substance to it? Yeah. The challenge for you as a reader, Emily, reading AP exams, and let's think of our students, is you're looking for that specific thing and you're, you're, you want to assign points as those examples get fleshed out, as the kind of points get earned for contextualization and everything else. But you as a student, we know you guys are struggling there with your pen under time conditions, trying to get specific with this. So I think they yeah. gave enough breadth and topics and time periods to allow people to drill down into that strength. And I do just want to encourage AP world teachers, like don't, you know, th this is a great DBQ for teaching purposes, but like, you're still going to be throwing darts every year. You're going to realign for next year. Oh, great. You taught the Mexican revolution. It won't be on next year's exam. So yeah. it's about those skills. But um, what did you hear, Emily, from students as you posted about this online and, and what's been the consensus? Because I'm definitely looking at at the, the chat as well. Well, I haven't posted a ton about it online because I was terrified I couldn't do the math and figure out when I was allowed to talk about it. So I just figured I'd wait because <laughs> I was really scared. But I will say, yeah, students are saying they felt pretty good. Some students are saying the LEQ was kind of the funkiest part. But then other students are like, I loved the LEQ because again, if you, I mean, if you read the prompt correctly and you know a decent amount about the Inca, well, boom, SA2 is, you know what I mean? Each of these, could be relatively straightforward. And again, yeah, the thing I want to point out to teachers and students for if you're taking another like a push or AP Euro next year is that each of these prompts seems hyper specific, but it's all under the umbrella of something very broad. So unit two or question two is unit one state building. That's all it is. How are states gaining and maintaining power? They just made you focus on the Americas or you, uh, question three is unit three land based empires. That's it, right? And there was a whole, there's one topic in there about religious changes. 
Um, and again, they're just making you focus on military causes of it. And same thing here is Unit 9, actually, right? And it's sort of the end of the Cold War. So again, yes, they're making your students go one step more specific, which is a good, but like ultimately, if you're teaching the CED, you're doing your best to prepare them for any of these questions, right? Yeah, and I just wanted, well, I'm gonna share my screen real quick yeah. and just point out a couple things. One, here it is, okay. Here's the prophet herself. Yes. Not practicing the dark arts, anti-social studies on TikTok. And you can see how right she was broadly about the, the big picture here of the exam. If you don't follow anti-social studies on TikTok, Definitely do that. And very fun account with lots of Emily. Also <laughs> a much smaller account, but one that is actually, I've done, Emily, I don't know if you noticed, I did an AP US history breakdown I just put out today and the AP Englishes. Um, and I'm gonna do that for AP World based on what I'm hearing from all of you. The final thing I'm gonna say real quick as we wrap up is we don't really have information. We're not gonna get information about the multiple choice, but in our poll of more than 115 people in the chat, we are seeing that 46% of students call it hard. 14% um, say very hard. 36% of our viewers say that the multiple choice was easy and 4% very easy. So I'm gonna end that poll, but it seems like it was hard on that that 40% of the exam as well. Yeah. So the other thing I the other thing I found out, which <clears throat> maybe I've just always been wrong, is that they didn't go chronological in the multiple choice questions, is what I'm hearing that you were just jumping around. And I I guess I just always assumed they did, and I'm gonna have to stop assuming that, so. Yeah, it's one thing I'll say too, across AP US history and AP European history, question two short answer is always an image, just like it was with that little city plan thing. Uh, we didn't get any image on AP US history, which just really, it's like one of these things that's almost like a tradition and yeah. then it shows up. Or in AP European history, they use the phrase Protestant Reformation art which is not a thing in the CED. It's not a category you see. So um, anyway, oh, one thing, by the way, uh, Emily's a genius. I love your podcast. Listen to it in the bus. Um, I, hello, I was interviewed in the podcast. Didn't call you a witch, but we talked about medieval witches. Her podcast is called Anti-Social Studies. On your way out the door, everyone, give us an emoji for how you're feeling now that AP exams are over. So I'm hoping I get nothing but positive like sunglassy emojis. If you've liked this video, press that like button, subscribe to our channel. And Emily, thank you for all the wonderful things you've done, your prophecies, your advice, your charts, all the things you put out for the AP World community. You are beloved by the people in this chat. That's all I've been hearing about. Thank you. Yeah, and just um, if you're taking an AP, if you're taking an A-Push next year, I'm still around. I do A-Push stuff too. Marco Learning does all that stuff too. And if you're not, if you're done, then just recommend us to your friends that are coming in next year. Because like you now see, you see how helpful it can be. So thanks for joining. Great. Well, thank you, Emily. Thanks, everyone. Emily, there's so much love for you in the chat. Um, and emojis. So have a great night. And congratulations on being done with the AP 